again for joining us this afternoon. This is the last um, artist and conversation session that we have. And today, um, oh, by the way, yes, I'm Kathleen Lipsick, the curator of this exhibition, and you are in the exhibition of State of Ocean and Beer And with me today is Heman and Joshua. And by way of an introduction, what I'm hoping that today's discussion is going to be in their respective practices and in relation to the works that we have on display in the exhibition for Heman. Foreign Affairs and um, Abstract Ministry of Times. And then upstairs, we have something like that Lecker Architects, architectural practice that the author is part of. Evident on the page, 
But when you repeat it over and over again, it more or less does not mean anything. Uh, and I think that's essentially what the media does, right? It, it tells you something over and over and over again until it doesn't really say anything. Uh, this is juxtaposed with the other series, Foreign Affairs, which is somehow representational of a kind of back end, I think, of reality. Where these are back doors are things that people don't want you to think about, essentially. Uh, and they are also access points uh, to a space or a situation that is somehow uh, important to produce this reality that we live in, but at the same time, um, it's so camouflaged that uh, it often sort of a, a, a points to the fact that it, it's meant to be camouflaged, it's meant to be invisible so that uh, certain deals or certain uh, things can be exchanged without even knowing that. So, in, in a way, by crunching these two series together, it produces a kind of effect for me, which uh, shows the front side of reality, which is the media, and then the back doors reveal the back end of it. Does this make sense? Yeah, it's like okay. the front stage and back doors of power. Yes, yes, exactly. Can, can I ask you to clarify maybe just one specific thing about the embassy? Because this was something yeah. that came up in our conversations. Yeah. That there is a misconception about embassies being sort of like a manifestation of a physical space. Yes. Like, but it's actually not. Like, it's so a manifestation of foreign policy. Yeah, yes. of an agreement. Yes, and I think exactly. that this is an important thing because we always think that we go into an embassy, right? And okay, for example, we're in Singapore, but we go into the Kuwait embassy and we now think we're on Kuwait land. Which is not. Which is it's exactly not, yes. not the case. Um, and I think you were saying specifically at one point that mm -hmm. it's not a physical reality. Yes. But it, it's something that is like kind of like an agreement that is at something that's mostly material, but the door itself is kind of like a threshold for that. I think the the embassy is very interesting for me because uh, it is a literal manifestation of the fact that our realities are produced by fiction. And it is through this fiction, uh, which is agreed upon by two or more parties, that produces this reality. So, for example, the idea of like walking into uh, a Singapore embassy in New York as a Singaporean, that you're on sovereign land in uh, Singapore, in New York, is crazy. Yeah. Okay? Um, but it, they need this agreement in order to produce slippages. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, they are, one of the biggest users of embassies, I don't know if you know this, is that certain countries cannot talk to certain countries. And certain countries can talk to these countries through another country. So, for example, uh, Singapore is very famous for this because we're always the middleman. So, for example, if country A uh, needs to talk to country B and they don't have a diplomatic uh, Agreement is it? That's what um, it's Diplomatic link? No. Well, <laughs> okay. It's I, I I can't remember the exact the word. The actual word. Anyway, you know yeah. what I mean, right? They don't have a. They don't have a. They shouldn't be talking to each other. They shouldn't they be talking to each other. They're not in the same clique. But uh, Singapore always yeah. produces this kind of middle ground. Then you can come to the Singapore embassy to like talk shit. Yeah. Right. So uh, I think. This is something that's also very, very, that interests me greatly uh, about foreign policy. In fact, it's, uh, it's a way of producing uh, relations that are often invisible. Thank you. Um, actually, that's a really great point. Um, if you don't mind, Joshua, if you could pick up maybe on this point of in, in, okay, you know, the, the quote that I initially started with, which was this idea about infrastructure being a medium of everyday politics, actually comes from the book Contract and Contingent, um, which is Angela uh, Mitchell Hollis's idea, or the theorist who works largely with theorizing a lot of the politics of infrastructure uh, and collectively. 
collectivizing. Um, if you could pick up maybe on this line, what Kim was talking about in terms of the invisibility and of uh, things happening and then how power marks those types of things. And why I'm asking you, when I'm thinking about when I was throwing this at you as a very broad thing, is actually your work on infrastructure when it comes to Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of your practice, um, if I may so just as a, say as an observer from the outside, there's a lot of unpacking of the sort of agreements or beliefs that you place in space that then form the way the space is built, but then how that in turn then polices the bodies that use those spaces. Um, and you don't need to do that. If you can comment on something, that's great. But I know you also do stuff on um, or, 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 besides our belief systems, religious beliefs, if you, if you can sort of like do some sort of spiral response. Yeah, um, sure. I mean, I, I think one of the things that uh, that I found really interesting about about sand. Well, I mean, not so much sand itself, although it's an interesting substance, and the trade is very. What you can see of it is interesting. Much of it is completely opaque, right? It's sort of a black box. And what's interesting about it often is what gets said about it. But I mean, what I thought was kind of interesting about all of these controversies, um, you know, first with you know, everyone sort of against Singapore and issues like Riau Islands and sort of coastal uh, infrastructure, uh, not co coastal ecosystems and the, all of the destruction that happens with sand buying, right? Sand oh, can I pause you for two yeah. seconds to just give everyone maybe the audience a little more context? Because yeah. I'm not sure if everyone can really, uh, Is everyone familiar with the issues around sand smuggling? Yeah. So, um, I mean, what was what was really interesting to me about that was um, that sand as a conversation kind of falls into this weird space between what we imagine as a sort of old school international order, of like Westphalian states that are solid and have well enforced borders and they have yeah. territorial quantum. It's like you know, you look on the map and there's a, there's an ink line around the outside. It's like a tinted drawing, right? It's a color yeah. on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so we assume that states are these things kind of like billiard balls that have a kind of a ontological realness, they're, they're, it's a thing, you know. Um, but what was interesting about, about sand is it showed exactly how slippery and problematic the question of territory was, and how odd it was now that in this age where so much of this is supposed to be kind of mediated or handled through very um, kind of delicate, sophisticated technological means, we think about, for example, that currency is one of the major ways that we deal internationally now. And that now we're in the global order, which is different from the international order, but we see this kind of old school Cold War geopolitics coming back, where to me, the major infrastructure of the moment is the island. I mean, if you look at the South China Seas, if you look at the role of the imaginary of Singapore, if you look at the kind of coastal expansions and these, these weird kind of ways in which people are making territory out of the oceanic again, it seems like there's this weird moment where we're going back to very physical things, like, yeah. you know, like ground. Yeah. Belt, when it's belt, made of, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, Belt and Road and all. And at the same time, then we're, we're and hydrology, right? If you look at what's going on in Cambodia and upstream yeah. downstream politics and all yeah. the Chinese stuff. But then at the same time, it's all being handled through this very, very complicated um, series of mechanisms that are either immaterial or they're abstract or they happen at a level where we don't see it. Yeah. But we still, again, this is what I love about the embassies and why I find the back door is fascinating because there's this public obscenity, right? The scandal when Jamal Khashoggi goes in and never comes out. Yeah. But the because there's this idea of this kind of old school uh, UN order of things where country, you know, this diplomacy, you know, we're diplomatic, we're, we don't kill people in embassies, right? That's not a good thing, right? So, you know, but, but if you imagine that it's actually a piece of Saudi Arabia, then, yeah, yeah. you know, it's a very Saudi Arabian thing, right? You go in and you don't come out. So, um, so, so it, is, it, it's, it's, it is very interesting. I think that um, the question of um, how, what the status of territory is, clearly it's very important. It's very important in an overt kind of crassly physical geopolitical way like it would have been with the great sea powers, you know, prior to World War One, even, you know, a very long time ago when geopolitics becomes a term, but now of course there's, there, there, there are all of these other media. So it's, it's and you know, a good case of this, I, the, the one I think of the most, because it's the most obvious, I have to fucking read about it every day, is Trump and his wall, right? And so the efficacy of the wall actually has nothing to do with that as a piece of infrastructure. It's something that just gets mediated. So it becomes about a kind of politics of anger and, uh, and a way of creating offense and a way of creating yeah. certain replication. So the relationship between the infrastructures and then their kind of lives within the media uh, is this kind of interesting back and forth. And it seems to me that a lot of that goes back again to exactly the point you raised, which is the key points, the kind of front stage, backstage yeah. quality of these and the, the questions to which they are 
physical entities or, or kind of just visible portions of a very, very kind of occult network that spreads out from them into a kind of a hinterland of politics and money and relationships and quiet exchanges. Yes. Um, Joshua, thank you for that, because I think that contextualizes a lot for us, and actually it's a very nice response to Peter's work. Mm -hmm. But the question I have maybe for both of you responding to this is because these sort of questions really permeate or really sort of like congeal in all your works in different ways. What is the impulse of using art to, to talk about this? Let's say of using, you know, so what is, what is the utility of having an art work that comes to this? Uh, or what you know? What are the political impulses that maybe you have when you're making these kinds of things? Um, it's actually a question for both of you because you both produce it in different ways. But maybe even if you want to, you want to speak. Art for you, maybe architecture, design, and also why art sometimes. Um, I'm expressing this through uh, the cultural sphere simply because I don't have any other means of expressing it. Uh, I'm obviously not an investigative journalist. I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm also not interested in becoming a politician or an investigative journalist. Um, so these doors are pretty much close to me, let's see. Um, but at the same time, I feel that uh, by producing images of these songs, uh, they do have uh, and, and then this having distribute them not only as artworks but also as images uh, on social media um, and through uh, representations like media representations like uh, on in magazines or you know, sort of like different sort of things um, it does produce a way of imagining politics uh, uh, that does not come from uh, more or less the political sphere. So it's essentially attempt, an attempt to shift this conversation away from propaganda and this kind of very you know, like uh, straightforward political statements into a sphere that can be talked about, uh, at least for me, uh, and debated uh, amongst uh, intellectuals. Uh, so I still I still believe that there is uh, uh, a, a high level a, a high amount of possibility to talk about politics outside of this kind of very uh, uh, systematic dogmatic uh, political systems um, and that's why I do it. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to uh, overstretch this. Meeting. Say. So I'm not deluded that it will produce an immediate political change, uh, which I think certain artworks can, but I feel that it's a much more, much long drawn out process. You see what I mean? So I think that uh, all artists should think politically, even if they're not politicians. Uh, but at the same time, they must. I, I think it's also to refrain from. Uh, treating the work as, or instrumentalizing the work as a way of uh, assuming uh, immediate change. I don't think change comes about uh, quickly, and I don't believe, even if, even if change comes to me, I won't believe it. I think change is always, uh, or more or less, uh, uh, accumulation of many, many, many uh, ways of thinking about how the world we live in. So that's my approach. Yeah, I, mean, I think I come at it from a kind of a similar angle. I mean, I, I am not in any kind of pure sense uh, kind of a political animal. I'm very, I mean, I'm very politically um, engaged in certain ways. I, I tend to kind of like have this little inversion of the old school kind of Greek Socratic idea. I kind of keep my politics private and I kind of keep my aesthetics publicly, right? But the two things are, 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 are very kind of the one kind of is a carrier for the other for me. And I think for a long time I've been very interested in, um, in what Rancier called the, in, I forget which book, I think it's Hatred of Democracy, but so he calls it the, um, the politics of the visible, right? That a lot of what happens now 
in politics is just the question of what is made visible and what's not. And that's why I was really interested in sand, because I felt that sand literally kind of uh, muddies the water, right? It like kind of gets in there and it, uh, it, it makes this squishy, weird substance that's not water and it's not soil, in our sense of like blood and soil, like our old school idea about kind of rooted yeah. territory being soil. So it's this kind of slippery stuff that you can, you can take a little grains from one place to another and make land kind of disappear and give here. And I think what's kind of interesting about it is that um, it, it is constantly kind of masking or playing with kind of notions about territory, which we think we understand, and it's making it very hard to see certain kinds of things. And so I was really interested in that article, not so much in sand per se, because I kind of feel like it's a dead end topic um, in a way. Like you, you can either become an investigative journalist and blow open the sand smuggling trade, or you can shut up because there's nothing else to say about it, right? So it's kind of a meta conversation about it. But at the same time, what was interesting about it as the politics of the visible is that I got this really nice, so what happened was I wrote an article for the Harvard Design Magazine about sand and sand smuggling, uh, making the case that it was, um, it was a terrifying topic because it, it slipped between the kind of categories which we traditionally think of as territory. And so it became very hard to kind of theorize or treat politically or even treat in terms of national conventions and so on. So um, I published the article because nobody reads the Harvard Design Magazine, so I said whatever I wanted to say. I didn't know that they were starting to put their stuff on Facebook. It kind of had a viral moment. And then I got this very polite, threatening phone call from the Prime Minister's office who called me and it was very spooky because the person that called me like went to high school with my brother-in-law, so it's kind of like, hey, how's it going? And basically what they said was they didn't think, um, okay, how do I put this? They, um, there was nothing in the article that was seen to be uh, kind of particularly problematic in the way that it represented Singapore, but they kind of said, well, we, we um, you know, there was a while ago with the big disputes that we had with Cambodia and Vietnam, and particularly with Indonesia, Everyone was really, you know, focused on sand, and now they're really focused on haze because that's what's going on. And kind of like, you know, we don't really want to get people worked up about this issue again. Like maybe, maybe write about haze, you know, which is funny because I was writing about haze for the same reason because it has this obscure meaning, yeah. right? Um, and and so I, yeah, I just I don't, I don't write about sand by invitation of the PMO not to write about sand. So, um, but but it really became one of those interesting things, and I think in our work that's just to kind of sum this up as we come a bit longer. But, um, but, the, but the idea of the role of the person who looks at politics within an aesthetics framework, and I think that this is what, again, if we look at what's on the walls in front of us in human's work, this is very key. This is about kind of making things visible because we live in a world which I think is kind of like the love child of like Andy Warhol and Vladimir Putin, right? It's like this world where all the information is there and we can't hear anything. There's no hierarchy, there's no reliability, and so we, you know, it's hard to see anything. I was wondering, at this point, if there was any questions so far from the audience, because I would imagine with such quite a loaded topic so far that we've been talking about what the aesthetics of artworks do in terms of making the invisible and invisible and how that relates to how the world is today. If there were any questions, none? Okay. Then I actually think, uh, what, Joshua, where you're, you're kind of taking us um, to this idea of information brings me to a question that I've been wanting to ask him also, which is, you've mentioned in the past that sometimes the images that you make are forms of data or data. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that, especially given that you just introduced this question of information? Yeah. Uh, I think whether we like it or not, uh, our, the, our lives are actually governed by multiple converging degrees about what something is or what something is not. And uh, I think what I'm doing is I'm merely extend, as extending these agreements into uh, the cultural space, let's say. So, but at the same time, what I'm trying to avoid very carefully is uh, to not tell people how they should look at my work. And I think that that is very, a very, very important thing that people uh, could, can do whatever they want with my work and they you know, uh, could make up their own minds about it rather than locking it down to insisting that it should be political or not. Mm -hmm. So quite literally, when someone walks into this space and they could look at this and they could really be thinking about landscape, let's say. So uh, this idea about data, I feel that uh, you know, the idea of information uh, is 
in every artwork, right, even if it's the most banal painting. Like, for example, landscape painting is essentially encrypting data of this landscape into this painting via the artist's mind. So I, I don't really see uh, or, or this designate a difference between uh, uh, whether a painting is data or not for me. It, it, it is data. It's how uh, something has been uh, inscribed. So it's through these sets of inscriptions, which is basically the artist downloading the landscape, mm. that uh, formulates this idea of uh, of data and how it. I see my work as uh, uh, hoarding, hoarding. I think hoarding is a good word. Hoarding data, and how that over times, uh, over time, could present itself as a series of uh, objects that talk about these data sets. I mean, we live in a world of big data, and I don't think we should be surprised that uh, everything is influenced by this amount of data, like the tiles that you're stepping on, to the lights that lights the space, to the fan that we have here, is actually more or less a result of uh, uh, accumulation of uh, data sets. So, uh, in a way, I think again to to bring data into the cultural sphere is very interesting for me because I don't want it to be only talked about by people in the military or people on in Facebook, you know. And I think it's also important that artists can claim this for the cultural sphere, rather than um, having to leave this conversation to people who are only interested in selling data, you know? Yeah. Do you want to respond to that? It does relate to the question for me, um, how different objects and how different materials present as data. You know, if you say that all your artwork is data, um, foreign affairs, has taken this permutation on PVC print on canvas in this yeah. show, but you're going to turn the next edition is going to be curtains and glossy and glossy. You know, so how 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 does that then? How, how do those ideas change? Or how does the idea of data change when you change object and material? And this this actually is a question that I would love to put to both you and Joshua. But second, Joshua, you make different types of objects. You make furniture. You make you design buildings. And this whole question of you know what the final product is and how this question on your politics of aesthetics, what becomes yeah. visible, what becomes like how do you make that decision when you're choosing the form or the object that you're making? So yeah. Maybe you start and then back to him. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean I, I that, it's a fascinating question. It's something um, kind of constantly thinking about because of, um, going back to what you said in the beginning of your last comment that you know we live we live in this kind of um, in, in the kind of warp and weft of these various agreements that affect us in various kinds of ways, right? So, you know, we are subject to data and we are also producers of data and, you know, yeah. that data adds value to all kinds of um, endeavors that we don't even really know about a lot of the time. I think um, what's really interesting to me is that as, as you know, somebody who, who gets involved in architecture is that um, we very often inhabit and aestheticize these material conditions. I mean, not even just aesthetic, we, we, we conceptualize, we, we come to terms with them and they affect us very deeply. But we are living in conditions that are produced by forces that are so far from the, yeah. the ways in which we think about them. I mean, you think you live in a building, you live in a financial instrument. Right. I mean, that's what a, a building is—a form of money. Yeah. You live yeah, yeah. in it, and and you know, um, you you can grow up in, in say a building and have a kind of whole phenomenological worldview, which is based on the fact. That, okay, so this is very American, right? Yeah. There was a basement. There was a dark and scary basement that had this kind of big mouth-like thing, which was where a laundry chute came down. And you know, for me, that's that's kind of the ultimate kind of. It's very that's the subconscious. That's where all the creepy. You know, that's where that's where you stick all the stuff that you're not that happy with, yeah. right? And then there, there's the kind of the world of light, which is above. And um, but you know, I, that that may be a deep kind of structuring of the way that I see the world, and I see it very affectively, right? But at the same time, that laundry chute in that basement existed because the cheapest thing when the building was built was black American labor. 
and you had people doing your laundry down in the basement because it was cheaper to do a basement and have somebody wash the clothes there than it was to take up space on one of the upper floors yeah. which you could rent or you could live in or you could entertain in, right? So that again is a kind of a, that, that's not how I want to think about my own subconscious yeah. as this black lady made doing laundry in, in the basement, but you know, that, that's the kind of, that, that's the way it shakes out, right? Yeah. So I mean, I think what's, what's always been very interesting for me is the way that the kind of the physical culture of things, I'm always looking at very, physical things, and I always kind of get shouted at by proper academics when I publish in geography because I'm looking at things like roadside planting, or so the way that a tree yeah, will yeah. not grow, or why why Singapore government loves bonsais in particular, yeah, yeah. as opposed to kind of things that would be much easier to deal with um, from a maintenance issue and a cost standpoint. Why is it that they've insisted on bonsais yeah, in certain yeah. locations, yeah. specifically outside the Istana, right? So if you look at this kind of stuff, I think to me what... So wait, why, why bonsais? Now I'm curious after. <laughs> wow, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, so um, so th this is what I've been writing about recently. It's, it's about the way that um, Singapore uses the environment to kind of enable uh, a whole set of political and kind of paramilitary operations, which you can do without actual policemen and military people, right? So right before he died, that's fantastic interview with Lee Kuan Yew. I, I love this, I love the man, yeah. because I had been speculating about this for 10 years, yeah. and basically they said, um, he was talking about landscape, and they always said, well, why, why is N Parks directly under the Prime Minister's office? And he said, because landscape is our secret weapon. And they said, what do you mean? And he used the word secret weapon. This is great. Yeah. I just read this paper called Paramilitary yeah. Gardening, right? Yeah. I was like, fuck yeah. yeah. Okay, and so basically he said, look, if you go and you drive by the Astana yeah. and you see a bonsai tree yeah. and you know what this climate is yeah. like, you know what it's like if you own a lawn and you leave it alone for four hours and the weeds yeah. are growing back and nature is always trying to re-encroach that clearing that you've painfully made and all the mosquitoes that you've just gassed out, right? But if you drive by and you see the bonsai, you know that the state is working. You know if right. you come here to do the business deal, or you come here to do your shaded backdoor dealings with the Israelis, you can do that because the state is functioning. So the landscape, it's, it's, it's intentional unsustainability. The fact that somebody has to constantly go back at it means that if it looks good, the state capacity is there. It's working. You can trust it. And that's exactly why it was done in a certain way. And it's and you know this is this is not kind of a random idea. I mean, the landscape is very metonymic in Singapore. It's a series of kind of political ideas about how you manage and care for people, which I don't think come from any mainstream political tradition. I think they come from environmental determinism, ecological thinking, um, a lot of other sources. And the reason that politically it's self-contradictory and kind of improvisational and it makes not a lot of sense is because it's not coming from conventional kind of political, yeah. liberal or illiberal political ideas in that sense. It's coming from a kind of a gardening mentality, which is very Yeah. Right? I, think, so, I yeah. think it comes from science fiction. Yeah. I think it comes from world making. Yeah. Because like in science fiction, fiction yeah. terraforming, yeah. essentially you have all the great science fiction novels begin with how a world is made and how uh, this, this is of course coming in from uh, both I, you know, like the politics of the Cold War and much before that, the, 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 the age of empires, right? Mm -hmm. that, uh, these, that there are worlds that need to, to be dominated yeah. and that uh, ultimately, um, I think this really makes sense for that, that also uh, we, we shouldn't have any kind of doubts that uh, in fact, Singapore has imperial uh, uh, ambitions uh, across the region, and this is of course expressed through not only uh, the landscape but through our national collections. Yeah. I think that uh, it's also a form of landscape that you know to prove that we have the largest Southeast Asian collection. It's it's a thing. It's, it's well, it's a, it's a collection of exotics, right? Yes, yes. yes. You know, it's exactly. it's kind of like your your botanical garden, model, yes, yes. where I think the whole thing kind of. Yeah, 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 I think it, it, everything sort of comes together once it's visible. Yeah, I think I think the other source is the island. I, oh. I, I'm thinking about this because I'm teaching this course now on island utopias, and also, yes, yes. you know, the students start to notice very quickly that all the island utopias look a lot like the prison plans. Oh. You know, the, the great, the great, you know, Renaissance utopias yes, look yes. exactly like the Panopticon in terms yeah, of the plan. Yeah. So it's you know, well, it's concentric. Yeah. So. And this is center point. Of view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so back to nitty gritty. The question was, um, I mean, this is great, but in light of all of this, how then do you choose the materials you work with? Because obviously, the world, you know, the world that we occupy, live, and the politics of the world we occupy, mean that certain things get taken wrong. Whether it's a bonsai in Afghanistan, yeah. 
But then, what then with your, with your practices, your respective practices, does the materiality of the object change, or how do you then insert yourself into this language? Um, I, I never begin uh, to sublimate an idea into an object via material, never. The first step I would always think, the first thing I would always think about is scale. I think scale is something that uh, affects how we look at something uh, and, and, and it affects, it, 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 in a way scale convinces us of what something is. So for example, like this series, uh, there is a very important uh, relationship between the scale of this work, which is slightly larger than a human being, because I want it to be, be returned into uh, something that resembles a passage. So for example, if I were to only show like one photograph on at this size, it literally gets reduced to being a document. And I'm not interested in producing more documents uh, because uh, it's just not interesting, you know, to 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 pile on uh, data as data. For me, it needs to sublimate into something else that is a totally different animal. Let's say. Um, so, from in a way, it always begins with scale. And material is something that is very, very soft and pliable for me. For example, uh, we all know that the, in Singapore, there's one material that's very, very hard to work with. What is it? For sculpture or building? And, and everything. Well, wood, timber. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. And by extension, paper. Yeah. I think every artist that has tried to deal with paper has always been a disaster because of humidity. And uh, my approach with paper is whenever I use paper for a certain work, it must not resist destruction. So it must become something else than uh, a, 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 an object that needs to be conserved. So um, having said that, um, I guess that the second step is really to think about conservation within this sort of situation. But at the same time, of course, the material has its own sort of like implicitness, right? About uh, uh, that there is obviously uh, uh, a conservation value to these prints being on canvas rather than on any other material. Uh, and also the perception that it becomes an art object. So I think there's all these sort of complexities that comes in when I think about material. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, it, it shifts very quickly for me between one material to another, and it's not uh, it's not an exclusive value in my work. Is it, I mean, that must be an interesting moment of the, the transition from one material yes. to another, mm -hmm. and yes. what it does to the, you know, to the subject, right? yes. to the content, or to the image is quite interesting. I, I feel that it's, it, it's becoming more and more, uh, in a way, at least with audience perception, it's not so jarring as it was before in like the year, like like twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. Simply because I feel that we're living in a world where uh, an image uh, has entered digital reproduction. That it's just moving from one thing to another, from one social platform to another, to another, to another. That uh, nobody really thinks about what is original anymore, right? So there's no sort of like a, a concern about its, that, that what we're looking at is a verbatim uh, meaning or something like that. So I think that helps a lot. Yeah, and then that kind of like, that sense of authenticity in paper, paper becomes like the domain of fetishists, right? Yes. I mean, you've got one of these openings of Tyler Print, yeah, right? Yeah. Where everyone's around like, ah, oh, you know, this sense that you're at a real art event because they have good cheese and uh, Dohosa is in the building with his mom and you know, you, there's this real kind of like old school, like, but it's funny because in the way... Don't let Emmy hear this. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it, but it's kind of funny because, you know, it's this moment in which you look at these things which are yeah. taking these kind of 
antiquarian, completely overcomplicated forms of replication, yes. and then and then really getting into it and like videoing yeah. every moment of the finger like touching and the canvas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all perverted. It's like pornography. <laughs> is that it is. It really is. is. The, the the word to use is pornography. It's and like it's like watching people uh, post photographs taken with 35 millimeter cameras yeah, on yeah, Instagram. Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just showing this kind of this crisis about value, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's like, but you know what? It's exactly like um, I know somebody who sells really expensive watches, wrist oh watches. God. You know, these ones that are like four hundred thousand dollars. And the whole yeah, point yeah. is that it, it is um, like a thousand times in excess technologically of what you need just to tell the time. Yeah. Yeah. The whole point is you make it do something useless and complicated, yes. and then that becomes so. It's it's a it's literally reactionary. Like, Gears go backwards and stuff, and it's, you know. But that's yeah, so that's another conversation. But no, I think for material from our side, I mean, I I, I don't I don't want to think I, I'm not a recovering architect. I'm not gonna, you know, like architects are people with problems. Like architects are like child molesters, and you know, because you you are you are brought through this educational system, which comes directly from a kind of a French 18th century tradition, even with the language like the charrette. The yeah, skis and like all this stuff that you use, yeah. and you're brought, you, you're, you're kind of put through these rounds of punishment. It's kind of public humiliation where you pin up your work and it gets torn apart, um, sometimes literally. And, and the whole idea is that what you're doing is really important because you shape the material world that affects people. Yes, yes. And so you come out of school with this sense of like heightened responsibility and also um, incredible insecurity. Like, am I, you know, because you're like, at, you know, it's all this Ayn Rand bullshit, yeah. right? You're carrying the globe on your shoulders and being independent and shaping lives and all this stuff. And, and, but when you get out in the world, you, I mean, if you're smart, you look around and realize that most of what people respond to in an architectural environment has absolutely nothing to do with either form um, with a kind of a performance of a political position, and it certainly has very little to do with the kind of materiality of the environment in any kind of fundamental way. Like, I mean, to your sense, like, you know, so, so we went to school, and of course, what's really chic, what's always chic, it's evergreen, it's this kind of like Weimar era post humanist stuff like Hilbersheimer, and, and you think, wow, if we ever really built that, like, people would really they, they'd realize false consciousness, right? And then you come to Singapore, and it's literally just Hilbersheimer block after Hilbersheimer block after, but you know, yeah. and you realize that, you know, the form, people don't respond to form in that way. We're not, we're not that responsive. No. Form has fallen on really hard times, and basically nobody gives a shit about it anymore. I mean, everyone in architecture is talking about systems and networks and, you know, procedural stuff, parametrics, data. Yes. Um, and at the same time, you know, so for me, what, that's when, that's when we became very interested in, in questions of affect and where it comes from in architecture. And by and large, it tends to come technologically from a series of like really obscure sub-discourses and, and techniques, specializations in professional areas, which architects don't even know about. Yeah, yeah. Like the technology we used upstairs, which is supposed to drive away people from situations exactly like this, is yes. like a weird sonic technology, which is designed to make a certain area of air feel incredibly uncomfortable by vibrating at a certain frequency. And it's also biased against certain demographics. It can be used in a racist way if they want. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's completely valuable. And that's being designed by security consultants who never attend the same meetings as the architect. So yeah, yeah. in a way, they're, they're, and you know, if you look at kind of um, addictive, you know, look at casinos, and this, this is done by a really obscure subset. And these are not just kind of obscure cases. It's like retail environments are scent branded, right? So they're companies that, that curate the smell you know, so that when you're in Neon City, you could be blind and you know you're in Neon City because yeah. there's a smell that goes right to the hip campus and you know where you are. Yes. And it affects you on a much, much deeper level. And when they look at kind of things like consumer behavior, you realize that the architecture has like, it's just the aestheticization of the environment. It carries a lot of messages and cultural meanings, but in terms of the way that uh, the power that it holds, it's, it's very, it's like the frosting. Right, on the cake. So to me, I we've started to kind of move away from that, right? It's the curtain. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. <laughs> no, it's, it's, the, it's the Wizard of Oz thing, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the kind of the ineffectual little. There's the magician, and then there's the, then there's all this kind of idiotic scenography that happens in the foreground, and that's basically architecture. Yeah. So and it explains the kind of latent kind of fascism of the architectural personality. So on the one hand, you're given all this power. On the other hand, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Okay. That's great, but when you then okay, so what, so then when you then approach a project, how how, how do you literally start thinking through it? Because obviously, actually, as you're actually speaking to us, you're articulating a very clear political position, actually, and 
even though you say your politics are private, it very much actually comes out. And so the question is, you know, we can articulate these types of positions with words, but a lot of times the works that both of you make, I mean, you write essays as well, but beyond that, when you're actually making, how then does this thinking or way of advocating for sort of type of awareness take shape? If, if we sort of it on. I, I think, yeah, I think it, it happens in kind of, for me, increasingly in kind of fringe forms yeah. of projects. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm closing my office down. Like, we're trying to do less and less and less. It just, it takes 10 years to close an architectural office. As it turns out, but um, yeah, I mean, because you have liability that just goes on forever, and so to support your insurance policy, you have to do projects, and projects last two to three years. So it's, it's you know, once you get into it, getting out of it is like this incredible, not things they teach you in school, by the way. Um, so, so I mean, what, what we like to do um, more and more is to, to look at kind of explicitly critical areas where the materiality can start to speak in ways that might affect people's understandings of the environment itself, rather than just being an environment that is kind of mute and presents itself in a neutral way. So we don't, we either do stuff where we can see social impact happening, or we do stuff which is explicitly fantasy, so it knows that it's bullshit from the beginning, and you, you know, you just do bullshit, because the bullshit's fine. I mean, but, and, and increasingly we look at projects where we see clients who, like us, have a kind of an, um, are not on super good terms with reality. Like, you know, because architects always perpetuate the real, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And increasingly, I, I, I see many other, yeah. ev almost every other genre of, kind of artistic or creative practice is allowed to play with the real. Architects don't do that, right? If we do that, we get we get considered uh, like you know weird. Oh, right, right. Right. Yeah. Um, so or they say, oh, it's just art. It's yeah. art, you know. So um, to me, I, I kind of I, 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 we're shifting in that direction, it's, but it's it's a process. Before I uh, open up to the crowd, I totally forgot to tell you this, and this might interest you. Um, so the work upstairs, which works off a sonic device, which lets out a sound that is very uncomfortable for teens or adults, doesn't actually work on anyone that loves heavy metal music. Oh. Just to let you know, we, we, because we've been doing tours, and there were a couple heavy metalers yeah. who said, you know, who play in heavy metal bands, and they would be standing next to the device and says, Absolutely don't hear anything, and you turn it off. Yeah, that's probably why I don't hear anything. It's, <laughs> it's years of listening to Pantera. Like, you know, yeah. like, um, but that's funny because I guess people that have a slightly kind of sadistic consumption yeah. choices. Yeah. Yeah. But would it, that also affect people who listen to like noise? Yeah, I would also. Yeah, because it's the same kind of like decibels, yeah. right? I think what's really annoying about this thing, um, what described to me by people who can hear it well, I, I can hear it a bit, but not very well, is that it's constantly at the edge of perceptibility. Right, right. It's like trying to remember a word when it's like on the tip of your tongue. It's just really annoying to try and see the shape of something that you can't get it. Yeah. I know in, in the un, like underground passages leading up to the train station in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. in order to drive out the junkies, they will play classical music. That's right. Yeah. Like uh, Vivaldi, mostly Vivaldi. <laughs> you think they like it? It just yeah. drives people crazy yeah. when you're high or something. Do we have any questions from the audience? Or, uh, do we have any questions from the audience um, for either? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, just how long is this Well, yeah, to four, four thirty, for um, four, four thirty. Questions? No questions. Uh, Otherwise, I'll just have one or two more, yeah, and then yeah. really, yeah, because we kind of, <laughs> we kind of get absorbed because this is, this is all very fascinating. Um, okay, one of the things I actually wanted to ask both of you, yes. um, which I feel now is a little bit irrelevant, uh, <laughs> is actually because we are at, we are in an exhibition that responds to horror films and the question of horror, and obviously yes. the question of fact that the question. Um, you know, specifically when we spoke um, in, in the development of this installation, you actually introduced me to Raffles Hotel. Yes. Um, do you remember the film? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, no, I mean like, because, and, oh. and, and I know that Raffles Hotel isn't directly, let's say, related to this selection of these works, but at the same time, having watched Raffles Hotel, the sort of way that the building and the room speaks to the sort of, yeah. Um, kind of actually doesn't even speak to but freaks out the main yeah. character. So basically the main character in Raffles Hotel, which takes place in Raffles Hotel, is a Japanese
Japanese woman who goes and looks for her lover. She stays in Raffles Hotel, sees a ton of weird stuff, but also has the building sort of have an atmosphere of haunting her without there sort of being a let's say a ghost. And then it kind of goes into this weird surrealist thing where she kind of runs off with the blue dog for I don't know, Spawn, whatever, puts on. It's all Malaysia. Is it Malaysia? Yeah. Then she wears like a cameo looking for her lover who is a Japanese actor. And then it ends with her becoming then in some house and him taking a photo of her and she turns them. Um, and you always hear the flashes of the camera and she turns into a photograph. Mm. Um, so. <laughs> And I remember you showed that to me, and you were talking about it, and it wasn't necessarily a horror film. Mm. Um, but it was something that was definitely, that you thought was a horror, but you, you definitely said it was a horror film. And, and I was wondering whether you could speak a bit about mm. that relationship, that film, yeah. but also, you know, the affinities that perhaps you have in your practice to other, to either filmmakers, writers, or um, Has anyone seen it? Raffles Hotel. Charles, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, it's a very strange film that was made by Rui Murakami, a Japanese novelist, and it actually was adapted from the novel that he has written when he was staying in Raffles Hotel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that novel comes from a place where it's obviously, it's very obvious that he thinks of Raffles Hotel as a kind of utopian architecture that one can run away to yeah. from something. Uh, and I think this is again an extension of empire, right? That, you know, like South Asia and in turn Southeast Asia is, you know, sort of falls under the category of the new world and that you could uh, become a new person by, by, by entering this sphere. Uh, so I think the reason why we, we spoke about this film is because uh, uh, I have a habit of attempting always to influence like the curators that I'm working with for the shows. And I want, in a way, this show to talk about horror in not so much like a frightening mode, but that it's frightful. Uh, that our realities are, are, are essentially nightmarish to begin with. Uh, and I think that that film encapsulates a lot of that kind of uh, mood of, of being left on the outside of that architecture, even if you are within it. Um, it doesn't really make sense to talk about this film unless you've seen it to a certain extent. Yeah. So, uh, but what I think is very interesting uh, is to maybe then ask you a question about yeah. why you chose to think about horror within the context of developing an exhibition for the Asian Film Archive. AFA came to me mm. with the suggestion of doing a horror show. Oh. And I've actually said, and I, I shared this with Josh, I was like, oh God. Like, my first reaction was like, Ugh, what do I do? My work is so much about systems theory, about infrastructure. Where do I even begin with something like affect? I don't know how to do feelings, whether in real life or like <laughs> theoretically, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, you know, I can give you a really good logical argument, but so, I mean, this show pushed me in ways, in my practice in ways that I would never have thought myself, but this is where I have to really take my hat off to KB, the commissioner and the producer, is that he saw something in my practice that he thought horror should be the thing, because I had actually asked him, can we do sci-fi, can we do something else? You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated and obsessed with the Cold War and there's a ton of fantastic Soviet uh, sci-fi films that were shown in Singapore. Let's do that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and ended up, what it, what it came down to me and what I realized is like, I don't get frightened. I love watching horror films, but I like the great horror films. I like exploitation films. You get frightened. You get frightened. No, I get I don't. terrified. I'm not actually very afraid of oh. much, you know, so, uh, so because of that, it, it I, I think like that, when, when you start to think of that, you can kind of, it makes so much sense with the way the show has come out because it ended up being what is horror. Right. What is horror as an instrument and what is the space of horror and specifically what is the space of the monster? Because if, the hor if horror is crystallized within this object, right? horror is a language we can't necessarily always talk about as a feeling, 
difficult to wrap our heads around. Sometimes yeah. we create things to objectify, to personify, whatever. So the monster itself, then I was like, so then what is the monster? So what is that space? So this, and in the and in the end, what the show ends up becoming is almost a history of that because you have, you know, it's it's actually different artists who do different research practices and yeah. different research objects that if you see the string coming through this. And I say this for a lot of people, you kind of see a, a, a sort of history of Southeast Asia, but that runs under the surface of the show. Right, right, right. Right, and that, that's more like a conceptual device that I put in the back of my head as I was, as I was talking to different artists. And it was really actually the question, you were one of the first artists I spoke to, because um, especially in, the, in actually developing this show, and it's not just because I love your work, but it's also, I love the way you say it. So, so much of this, the show is actually based on the way that different artists think mm. and being posed with the question yeah. of, okay, if I talk to you about horror, how do you start to have this conversation? And a lot of times, even though a lot of these works are scary or work on the space of feelings, um, and it's not a feeling of, I scare the shit out of you, it's a sense of disquiet, a sense of feeling like something is wrong with me every day and trying to pick back a part or, or something about an inheritance we got, it's all about ways of thinking around it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how. So in the end, I never escaped myself and did an affect thing per se, even though it's definitely in there. But it, yeah. but this is really, in a sense, different ways of thinking. And yes. the way that the artists have come together in this is because of ways of thinking rather than ways of making. Which now I kind of see how, why you asked this question because I asked so much about making, but but making it itself and thinking kind of doesn't get separated. And also why I asked about making. Because a lot of times we look at objects and we have an aesthetic experience, whatever, and we can go through a formalist discussion, which is kind of boring to me because I think it's more interesting like if your choice is to make something into, let's say, here a print or um, then a curtain, um, it's the discussions that we start to have about how you see through that mm -hmm. and why yeah. those, you know, mm -hmm. that are more interesting. And also, why I should also say, um, Joshua wrote a book, Horror, Horror and Architecture, mm -hmm. which I read very, very early on in my research process, which is why Joshua got involved in the project, also why I wanted so much that um, <coughs> Lecker, um, um, not so much curious, but sorry, though, though I feel sometimes that when we were talking with each other so much about this idea, it was almost, almost co curatorial the way that you create the NLB exhibition. Mm -hmm. Because of the way that you build space, it's sort of mind blowing you know, and, and you, his book was so important for thinking through some of those ideas about what some of those, mm -hmm. what, it's more the language of horror. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and the way you approach it, I think is actually quite similar to the way even I started to build this show. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes. yes. So, and thank you for telling everyone how much you tried to make feel like I had no idea after that, but I always know. But this is the thing, I actually think well, that I when, it, it's what, it, it's the way that, I think when you're also building a show, it's melding of thinking rather than objects. The objects is just the manifestation yeah, and the yeah. byproduct, yeah. actually, of a lot of thinking and a lot of talking. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just add one more thing to this. There's been so much discussion because I've been doing a lot of tours, walking people through the space, yeah. and we get a lot of questions about each individual work, and it's quite interesting. You know, I brought a bunch of students around. And the first thing was, Kim Chang is quoting Andy Warhol. <laughs> I'm like, Really? Which is not untrue. Yeah, which is not untrue. And then you know, then they go on and have their own discussion and they create their own type of conceptual paradigm around the work, which is interesting, um, as long as we all can have sort of discussions around it. And I think a lot of what, why the show was made was that it was not made to end with a product, but it's really about the discussions that we have. Because I feel like any work that you pull from the show, you can put with another work from the show, and they'd still be talking. Yeah. You know, even if you're not placed next to each other. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm blah, blah, blah. But do you guys have any questions? Yeah, we have a question. No? Yeah, we have a question. This yeah. is, well, this is a little bit more of a yeah. random thought yeah, than a question. Course. It might course. end with yeah. a question. Um, I was thinking back to the very beginning when when all of you were discussing kind of rendering visible and the mm -hmm. process of politics and visuality, which is about making visible the political infrastructures and networks that we that are immaterial that we can't normally see. Um, and so it kind of struck me as you've been talking that 
on the one hand, um, both this work and the chair are exactly about um, kind of rendering those things visible through things that are themselves part of that infrastructure, right? The doors, the chairs, um, looking at the actual material world, but in a way that is not a document, precisely. On the other hand, some of the other works in this exhibition, and particularly um, the films, use um, the figural to do that, right? The monster is exactly a figure that is not real, but conglomerates that immateriality not in little bits of the real world, but in a in a figure that is not part of the real world. And I just wondered if it would be interesting for you know, to reflect on the, those different forms of representation. I, I think, yeah, there's definitely, I mean, you're onto something there in terms of, I think, the way artists structured approaches to this. I think in, in both cases, I would say, I, I'm going to speak on behalf of your words, so tell me if I'm wrong, but I think that there, there are two different ways of figuring the monstrous, right? The monstrous, the monsters are such a fascinating um, kind of cultural fixation, it's a form of representation. I mean, to me, when we're looking, I think about the chair, I was reading a lot about the, the documentary photography of traumatic landscapes. I was reading about a photographer who was going around photographing landscapes from the Civil War in Sri Lanka, for example, and trying to confront the kind of the banality of the landscape itself, but the, trying to communicate the history. And it's very problematic there, right? Because what's happening is the government is now going around and buying all of these sites of human atrocity and turning them into beach resorts mm -hmm. to kind of scrub it. You know, um, or sites of heroic memory on behalf of the kind of Sinhalese government, right, who defeated the Tamil Tigers and so on. So, um, I mean, I think for, in many cases, if we look at the chair, we look at this, there's a quality of the monstrous that is kind of, um, an, say, um, an effect of a system, an effect of a kind of a history working itself out, an effect of unseen processes. Um, there's, there's something discreetly monstrous to me about the back door of a site of power. I mean, that is implicitly terrifying that it needs one. Um, you know, uh, and it says a lot, I think at the same time, like if, if you know, for other artists who, who try to play with the figure of the monster, and they're kind of almost working the other direction, which is to take these familiar monstrous figures and then try and unpack a little bit um, what, what their meanings are, like how they figure, um, what they purport to kind of represent. Um, and, and specifically kind of in this context, I mean, one of the things we kind of kick back and forth a lot behind the scenes is this idea that um, the post-colonial is inherently a kind of a monstrous construct. And the monsters are very, these hybrids, monsters are a very good way of talking about the way that these histories come to roost, especially when these societies take ownership of themselves, sort of, right? And they carry on a lot of things that you know, happened before. So I, I think it's, it, to me, it's a, kind of a, it's a kind of a directionality and it kind of has to do with where, where the artists wind up in their, their process. I mean, if I may just, if I may just respond um, curatorially, it was something that was definitely thought about in this contemporary exhibition. I mean, what Joshua is referring to is that um, a lot of films in the 50s in the golden age of sort of late film making, when we talk about Pontiana, the Pontiana, the Oily Man, you actually have a language of horror films that uh, comes to light. So you have like, the Pontiana is the first sort of multilingual film made. So it's a very popular film, but it's also, um, film theories have, have written about it as being a form that articulates a type of national language. And we're talking about a very 50s, 60s period, yeah. but then it changes later as consumption and teen culture comes in, because the horror B movie and teen movies are like cheap uh, drive through stuff. So, so there's a film history to this or not, but let me return to the contemporary art thing. Definitely in this exhibition, when I said like it's a history of the monster, it's literally a monster as a figural object, where you have the rear tiger, you have the Pontiana, mm -hmm. and you kind of end with human, where the monster is nothing but an atmosphere, or feeling, mm -hmm. you know, and the monster could be a sort of perception of maybe a puppet master behind the scenes, a sort of idea. So it's almost like the dematerializing of the monster through history because societies have changed. And, and what we fear, or what is reflected, or how the monster is a form changes, is because of our, the social pressures of what gives us fear as individuals and collectively now has changed. And I think that you can see that in registry. Okay, so that is me responding to you, just saying, yeah, we thought about it, and, and you can kind of like you can work for, work it out in the room, the building over there has more frivolous monsters than the 
sort of, sort of more systematic atmospheric motifs are here. Like if you wanted to run a thread through it, you could thread the works together. But in a sense, it's also a really open-ended exhibition where you can enter from anywhere. But um, sorry. So I just want to respond to that. But Heeman, did you have any sort of response? To me, I think it's interesting though that the, the question then of Raffles Hotel, right? Where you finally, <laughs> and, and the NLB show where the, I mean, we start out with very cartoonish monsters. I mean, Mignac I mean, yeah, starts out as a Dempsey Road rapist and winds up like a guy wearing black yeah. seaweed all over his body to kind of be more monstrous, right? It's, it's weird. Yeah. Um, and, and now it looks very, like, almost camp, right? But then by the time we get to something like films like uh, Raffles Hotel, or like in sci-fi, um, things like Stalker, yeah. or Downstream Color, like films like this where what happens is so abstract, um, you're really, you have to be talking about social history. Yeah. No, it doesn't yeah. make any sense otherwise, no, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, when we're talking about Raffles Hotel, what we're really talking about, I think, is post-colonial Southeast Asia, yeah. and that's the horror, yes. that's the horror in it. Yeah, yeah. Really, no, you know, no, it definitely is. I mean, the form of the monster is fundamentally historical in some senses. Mm -hmm. And like, what, and what, I mean, the funny thing is, like, in film theory, and the reason why I'm going back to film theory so much is because this show was made for a for film You know, so it is sort of rooted in some of those discourses also. Because the audience for this exhibition is both the film audience and then our audience. And sometimes they don't overlap, but sometimes they do. Um, and I think the show tries to be, to live at that space of the overlap. Um, and so, I mean, with film history, film historians, they call the monster the return of the press, which is a Freudian term. So it's history returning to haunt itself, past traumas coming out. And you can definitely see that literally in some of the works here. Um, be it Eclipses, for example, he talks about his collaborators as ghosts. I mean, he, he, he literally calls them a ghost, and yeah. he says that, and he made that film in a haunted um, house, um, and he literally takes up those forms and he and that entire narrative is a music video to the experience of being a Vietnamese refugee from the Vietnam War. Yeah. And the sense of longing and what historical trauma does to you. So in a sense, like there isn't like you watch it, there isn't a figural monster anymore. But the language of it is one that he's quoting from. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, definitely. I, I think that there's no way to escape the monster without thinking of it historically. That's my yeah, and also it's a contemplation of the present. I mean, yeah. it's always that weird way in which historical issues come back, and then yeah. you also kind of mm -hmm. find ways of talking about the present that you can't talk about the way. That. I mean, this yeah. is what I saw with you know <clears throat> documenting those stories in Singapore as well. I mean, they were about the past, but they were also very much about you know late capital and yes. abstractions and yes. the economy and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys want to know, Ela, who does develop the tours for this, but also has an archive room upstairs, runs a project called Spirits of Echoes, where she collects ghost stories that Singaporeans tell one another. And what she has found is that actually where ghost stories come up are moments of trauma, personal or collective trauma, yeah. like national crises that don't have language, but then take forms as ghost stories. Yeah. And she finds this concentration of ghost stories based on these types of traumas. So there's something also to that. Sorry, I've been taking your question and gone like, oh, but um, did you have it? Did we answer your question? No, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, Any more questions? Yeah, it's, yeah. Any more <laughs> questions? <No. laughs> Any more questions? Are we, uh, let me see where we are at. Yeah, I think we're good. All right. Um, Last questions? Yeah, is there any more? Questions. No? All right, well, if not, thank you so much for spending the afternoon with us. Uh, just round of applause for Keenan and Joshua.